Hello everybody, and welcome to a video dedicated to my top 10 favourite vehicles in War Thunder. Yes. Uh, this video is sort of a thank you uh, for 50,000 subscribers. Oh my goodness. You're all absolutely amazing. And people have been asking me to do this video for a long time, a very long time. Uh, now these are not the top 10 best vehicles in War Thunder. Ha! Far from it. No, these are the top 10 vehicles I've enjoyed playing the most over the last year or so, that's all. Uh, so yes, huzzah! Number 10. So let's kick things off with the HS129B2 Duck. Yes, an obscure and strange looking aircraft that simply had to make my top 10 list. Now the more observant among you might have deduced the mystery behind the name Duck. Yes. Now I certainly don't like the Duck for its cockpit. I mean, it's like staring through a CRT television. I mean the gun sights on the outside! The outside! Oh no, I don't fly this slow, unmaneuverable poultry for its flight performance or style, no. I fly it for its charm. And guns, oh yes, it has a lot of those. People tend to drastically underestimate this aircraft. They see a duck and immediately grab their shotgun and just fly head on against it until they combust. When I fly this aircraft, I feel like I'm the underdog or the under duck in any given situation, which makes it ever more rewarding when you slaughter enemy fighters. Yes, people don't seem to realize that the adorable armored flying duck has an array of cannons that were designed to destroy tanks. Which is why I've dubbed this aircraft the Panzer Quacker. It opens up tanks like cheap cans of tuna. It's quite therapeutic to trundle along at stall speeds uh, with a ridiculous looking aircraft and put very large holes into enemy tanks and aircraft. Whack. Number 9. Next up we have the all-American F-84 Thunderjet. Yes, an early 50s strike fighter that I've grown deeply attached to, like a limpet. Now I think we're all in agreement when I say that it's one handsome piece of aircraft, yes. Part of the reason I've been flying it so much recently is because these things, these things doth butter my parsnips. Uh, I mean look at it, look at those curves, yes. Its cockpit is complicated and modern and has that new cockpit smell. Now mastering this machine takes a bit of practice. If you're a fan of plotting a climbing path and making your way swiftly up to altitude, well, uh, continuous climbing in the Thunderjet is like trying to roller skate up a volcano. Uh, it takes a bloody long time and by the time you get up there, you're probably regretting it and on fire. And contrary to popular belief, this aircraft is also a rubbish dogfighter. It cannot turn fight at all and it accelerates appallingly, probably because this aircraft was manufactured by Republic Ironworks, meaning it's as rugged as a rhinoceros, but heavier than a medium-sized cruise liner with ample swimming facilities. But hey-ho, it's very rugged. I found it can lose what at first appeared to be rather vital components like wings and tailplanes and chunks of fuselage and keep flying. So the F-84 does two things rather well. Firstly, it's faster than almost anything it'll meet and retains that speed very well, providing you don't touch the controls. This combined with the aircraft's ability to zoom climb very quickly, make it a great swift hit and run kind of aircraft. Number eight. No, wait a second. It says seven, but it's meant to be eight. Ah yes, the flying museum piece that is the I-153 Chaika. This little premium biplane is possibly the most hideously underestimated aircraft I have ever flown. What the Russians have done is lured the enemy into a false sense of security by making them think they're fighting an aircraft that's outdated. Whilst that's technically correct, you'd be amazed at how many people will gladly dogfight a biplane that turns faster than a warm pint of milk on a merry-go-round. This aircraft will effortlessly outturn everything it faces in War Thunder, and only once the foolish enemy are too close to get away do they realize the Chaika hits harder than a boxing glove on the end of a battering ram. Its two 20mm nose mounted Chevac cannons make short and violent work of anyone foolish enough to show their full silhouettes to you. The beauty of the system is that kill hungry pilots will scramble over to you like they've just heard a dinner bell to try to kill something they perceive to be outdated and complete tat. So much so, they'll happily dogfight sometimes with each other for a chance of getting a quick kill. 
As the Chaika is battle rating 3.0, there aren't any other biplanes flying around, and so you're seen as live bait. There's little more satisfying in this world than killing swarms of mid-40s monoplanes in a nimble cannon-armed biplane. Number 7, there we go. Yes, the mighty Japanese B7A2. This is by far, in my opinion, the most enjoyable torpedo and dive bomber in the game, bar none. Now looks can be deceiving, it might look as large and as maneuverable as one of the Solomon Islands, but this gull-winged wonder is more nimble than almost all of the fighters it faces. Like its real-life counterpart, it displays fighter-like handling and performance. It's actually quite fast. Naturally, it comes with a selection of bombs or torpedoes, all of which are quite, quite lethal. In the cockpit, you'll never have a dull moment, as the gun sight doubles as a Sudoku puzzle. Exhilarating. But wait, things keep getting better. It's bought two nifty 20mm cannons at the front, and a surprisingly lethal 13mm defensive machine gun in the rear, though why you'd ever stand still and bloody use the thing, I don't know. Apart from the lacklustre climb and roll rate, this aircraft is an absolute joy to fly, and once again, when people see a torpedo bomber, they tend to flock towards it, again expecting an easy kill. The shock and terror on their faces when a fat-looking bomber completely outclasses their thoroughbred fighters is nothing short of hilarious. I don't tend to fly the Japanese that much, but when I do, it's usually in the B7A2, yes. Easily and undoubtedly one of my favourite aircraft in the game. Number 6 Oh, you didn't think I'd upload 7 minutes of video without a British design, did you? No, this is the de Havilland Venom, an aircraft I've always enjoyed flying and have fallen in love with whilst grinding for the Hawker Hunter. It looks like a jet-powered bat. The best way to think of this aircraft is by picturing a de Havilland vampire that doesn't suck. Bah, a vampire that doesn't suck. I'm a comic bloody genius sometimes. Anyway, the Venom is dangerously fast and sometimes suicidally maneuverable. It is very twitchy. It twitches like a mouse with an unsupported cocaine addiction, but luckily the Venom is fast enough to prey upon most jets in the game and does so easily aside from maybe the MiG-15 and the F-86 Sabres that trumpet in top speed and climb rate quite easily. It can, however, outturn them if things get a bit saucy, which they do. The roll rate is headachingly good, but also adds to the rather frisky nature of the aircraft. Now let's talk about firepower, shall we? Yes. Like almost all of the other British jets, it sports a set of Espano Mark V 20mm cannons, which are for the most part quite, quite lethal. What they don't tell you is that in the default Hispano belts, a third of the shells are practice shots. Absolutely lethal, up to and around three yards. Short of hitting an enemy pilot in the eye, they're not very effective. Overall, I love this thing, and how couldn't I? I mean, it's got a twin boom tail. Splendid. Number five. Up next we have the American M24 Chaffee. Now this light tank might only have 40mm of effective front armour and look like a confused crab on tracks, but it secures a place on my list nonetheless. Simply put, this Yankee light tank is small, relatively nippy, and essentially carries the firepower of a Sherman tank. Yes. Now I'll be the first to admit it, it's not without fault. Uh, though it's light and relatively small, it has the profile of the Washington Monument. It's quite tall, and from what I can tell, it can't reach its top speed of 35 miles per hour unless you push it off a cliff. That aside, it is one of the most fun tanks I have driven. Speaking of the driving part, it takes corners like a dream. You follow the apex and you're fine, unless the cabbage behind the keyboard has no idea what he's doing. Uh, yes. But the tactics are quite simple. Speed ahead and outflank the enemy when possible, and then dance the Watutsi with any tanks that let you get close enough. If for some reason you're not already sold and heading down to your local Chaffee dealership, well I'll add that it has two rather spicy machine guns. Yes, one on the turret and one in the coaxial. And I have brought down countless aircraft with these guns. At least four. The little Chaffee goes down as one of the most satisfying vehicles to play, because it's so small, nippy, and has the firepower of a battleship. Well, a very poorly armed battleship. Number four. 
Oh yes, the Avro Lancaster, quite easily my favourite bomber in the twisted and sometimes evil world of War Thunder. Yes, regardless of its appalling battle rating placement and general habit of catching fire on a regular basis. Uh, but I'm not bitter, no, I'm not bitter about it, no. Now you'll note, I'm not playing or humming or singing the Dam Busters theme, which I really should be, but I don't want to get sued to buggery, um, so that's a quick disclaimer. Now, why is this on my favourites list, you might ask? Your answer can be found by looking at the screen uh, in front of you, because yes, obviously, this is a Lancaster. You need no further explanation. Now, despite the fact that Lancaster was indeed a night bomber, Gaijin, in all of their wisdom, have decided that you and every single fighter pilot chum on your team would all be able to see the Lancaster much better in full daylight. How lovely. This means, unless you fly at treetop level, dambuster style, which comes with the risk of making rather horrible contact with some very large and combustible trees, you'll almost never make it to your objective. Nevertheless, it's still a lot of fun to play, because it's a Lancaster. It carries a whopping great big payload, enough to sink a pocket battleship, 14, thousand pounds of T-based weaponry, yes, which is enough to flatten all three bombing points and still have enough left over to provide beverages for the enemy airbase, yes. Now there's a reason why I've not mentioned the defensive capability of the Lancaster. Uh, oh, oh no, oh no, I think we're running out of time, I don't think we can cover it, uh, okay. It's all fine and dandy until your bombing campaign is uncovered by enemy fighters. And then it's a sort of trousers down over a barrel situation, really. Number the third. Next up is the MC202. My opinion on this Italian fighter has changed sides multiple times over the last year, but right now I adore it. The cockpit is luxuriously decorated throughout. This must have been where the majority of the budget went. Italians. So why have I enjoyed flying this designer's shoe around the sky so much over the last year, you ask? Well, for one, it's faster in a straight line than anything else it faces, and since it climbs like a homesick angel, you're easily able to dictate the terms of any fight. And if things get a bit frisky, you can easily escape with your plane intact. The same can't be said for your dignity, however. Just open the taps, and hey, pesto! That's not all. It turns out the MZ-202 is actually quite maneuverable, and if required, can turn its way out of trouble. So what's the catch? Well, instead of going by the book and loading conventional bullets into their guns, the Italians have used a different book. A cookery book, really. Uh, what they've done is loaded their hardened spaghetti into their guns, which as you can imagine, isn't overly damaging. It's also fairly low velocity spaghetti, which makes shooting slightly more difficult. It's all a bit of a pain, really, until an enemy stalls in front of you and he's enveloped in hot spaghetti and cooks to death. Yes, delicious. Number two, please. The Tiger. With the exception of the Black Prince, the ground forces vehicle I've enjoyed the most this year by far. Absolutely brilliant for crushing the dreams of other less well-equipped heavy tanks. This big metal shoebox of a tank had to make it onto my favorites list, as it is the tank I have played the most ground forces games in by far, and for good reason. Its armor design may be boxy, I mean it's squarer than a mathematics professor in a pair of corduroy flares, but it reliably stops enemy shots from coming inside your tank and entering inside of your crew, most of the time. Now as with most tanks, the Tiger benefits hugely from angling your armor, even by a few degrees, it can increase the effectiveness of the armor by a lot. At range, this makes it incredibly hard to knock out, which is a good thing for you. But the real statement the Tiger makes is with its legendary 88mm cannon, yes. The 88 makes the Tiger the king of long-range combat at its tier. I've spent many a day sitting at distances, popping various tanks out of existence, which I might add is wizard bloody fun. You're easily able to cut through the armor of the vast amount of tanks you come across, and by the time the enemy crewmen have overcome their serious traumatic event inside their tank, you've got another one in the pipe. Yes, I love this tank because it's a tiger and because it's bloody good. Number one. And so we arrive at the thing I've been enjoying the most over the last year, the P-47 D-28 Thunderbolt. 
I know I'm as surprised as you are. This beast is the king of high altitude warfare. Up there where the air is clear, it's completely untouchable. And yes, I know it's not going to make NASA rethink their planetary launching systems, it doesn't climb very well, uh, but it's well worth the wait to get up there. And after all, on the way down it picks up speed like an out of control wheelbarrow for a cul-de-sac. And you will be travelling down quite a lot because that's where most of your victims will lay, sadly. Now I'm more than confident in saying that you could quite easily push the battle rating of this aircraft up and it would still be more than viable. I mean for a machine the size and weight of bloody Texas, the Thunderbolt can chuck its weight around and shift quite rapidly, though I wouldn't for a second recommend dogfighting in the thing. Due to its fantastic energy retention, it can play vertically quite well. And if you do get caught with your trousers down at low altitude, do not despair, as there's a reason they call this thing the Jug. It's a flying bloody tank. I've had large chunks of my wings taken off. I've had holes put where holes should not be in your aircraft, and it's still flown me home quite respectably. And when it comes to the business of dealing damage back, well, it has eight Browning 50 caliber laser machine guns to get the job done. And get the job done, they bloody do. These BMGs chuck out over five thousand rounds per minute. That's 600 pounds of death every 60 seconds. I've also really enjoyed flying this aircraft in the War Thunder Ground Forces recently, because as well as a blisteringly fast high altitude energy fighter, it's also a terrifying ground striking fighter bomber. It can deliver a serious bite. I mean, it's got more teeth than the entire Osmond family. Bombs, rockets, and not forgetting the laser hot dog firing Brownings, it comes loaded for bear or several bears. Bugger it, a colony of bears. This thing has the firepower to send them all to honey heaven. And so there we are, the 10 vehicles I've most enjoyed playing in War Thunder over the last year or so. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this behemoth of a video. If by some utter miracle you made it all the way to the end, well, comment below with the following phrase. I serve the Squidonian Empire, yes. Anyway, uh, cheerio.